In a country where diversity is a blueprint, where democracy affords its people the freedom of expression, where the people are guided by the spirit of Ubuntu and humanity is at the core of our ethos. Our spirit of determination unleashes our true potential. We are people with a distinctive charm, people with big hearts. We come from a people of integrity, dignity and great humility. We rise above every situation and limitation, for we are resilient. It's in the way we talk, the way we greet, the way we love, and the way we care. We celebrate each other. We are givers who open our hearts when the need arises, always willing to offer a helping hand to us and the world. From the beautiful skyscrapers of our cities to the Karua farms, our distinctive mountains and rivers. There are a number of factors that define our nation brand. Through its people, its culture and heritage, we are proud of our diverse cultures, the rich legacy of our forefathers that has left the anchor of our tomorrow. We are innovators, game changers. We dance in triumph as our feet vibrate on the African soil, where our hearts beat as one. A powerful vehicle to carry any brand message is through its people. At the heart of our nation brand, it's a simple yet very powerful movement that seeks to unite its people towards encouraging everyone to play their part in advancing South Africa's reputation and image. We inspire, we empower, and we celebrate active citizenship. We lift the spirit of our nation. We contribute to positive change. We are a nation of people who care deeply for one another. And our desired outcome is to create an active society that contributes to a prosperous economy. Oh, what a beautiful nation we are. We are South Africa. Good evening and welcome to the ninth annual Oliver Tumbo Memorial Lecture, proudly brought to you by the Oliver and Adelaide Tumbo Foundation in partnership with SAFM and Brand South Africa. My name is Natasha Ali and I'm the acting CEO of the Tumbo Foundation, but tonight I'm your program director. I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to sit, to sit in front of yet another TV screen or computer screen to join us for this lecture. I want to acknowledge the members of the Tambo and Chukudu families in attendance. And I also want to acknowledge the trustees of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation. I am so fortunate to have the support of a truly incredible board, some of whom either worked with or knew either Oliver and or Adelaide Tambo but all of whom will work tirelessly every day to ensure that the legacy of these two remarkable South Africans remains relevant and alive today. The foundation has been in existence since 2010, and it is a deep honor to promote, protect, and preserve the legacies of OR and Matumbo. For the last 11 years, we have created and implemented education-focused community development and advocacy programs. Through all our projects, we teach people and especially young people about the tumble values, integrity, humility, and selfless servant collective leadership. We hope that through these events and projects and programs, these values are passed on and their legacies remain alive. The promulgation of these values, however, looks different in every project. For example, this evening, the Memorial Lecture, where thought leaders from around the world over the years have tackled topical issues. Previous speakers have included Presidents Mbeki and Mutlante, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Professor Pumla Kola, and Dr. John Kani, to name a few. Another project, and my personal favorite, is the Nkantolo Education Project, where the values of the Tambos, their love of education, their love of young people and their development, 
and including Matambo's lifelong work as a health practitioner is emulated. This project involves sanitary towels being provided to young girls at four schools in Gantolo, which is the birthplace of Oliver Tambo. It also includes the provision of hygiene packs to all 4,000 students in those four schools. I'm thrilled to say that over the last four years of this project, we have donated over 50,000 packets of sanitary towels and assisted in ensuring that these girls do not miss school due to their menstrual cycles. The project simultaneously, and since last year, provides the schools and clinic in the area with clean running water and ablution facilities, which, as you can imagine, is especially important with the advent of COVID-19. Finally, the foundation hosts a variety of dialogues delving into various social ills affecting South Africa, Africa, and the world. These have ranged from food security and unemployment to gender-based violence, the fourth industrial revolution, and most recently, land reform. Through each and every project, however, our intention is clear and unwavering, to educate the world about the tambos and their legacies and why their legacies remain applicable today. We would not be able to do to achieve this mandate were it not for partnerships like we have today with SAFM and Brand South Africa, who are equally as invested in keeping the memory of the Tumbos alive as we are. On behalf of the foundation and its trustees, I would like to thank Lord Peter Hain for agreeing to give this year's Oliver Tumbo Memorial Lecture. I would also like to thank Luando Tasso for being in conversation with Lord Hain following the lecture. We all look forward to what I know will be a thoroughly engaging discussion. Ora's legacy is applicable now more than ever. And as we continue to do our work as the foundation and as the country, we invite all of you to partner with the foundation in keeping this most important legacy and exemplary set of values alive. With that, I invite you to tweet and post about the lecture using the hashtag Tumbo Memorial Lecture across all social media platforms. And time allowing, Londo will pose some of your questions that you can put into the chat box if you're on Zoom or in the comments section on Facebook and YouTube, and she will pose them to Lord Hain. I hope you enjoy this event as much as we do, and I'm sure you are as excited to hear from Lord Hain and Londo as we are. Thank you. The strength of his speaking came from the clarity of the thought and the deep, honest integrity that lay at the heart of everything that, that he said. Everybody knows that his role was absolutely critical. Nobody else could have done it. He was a man of peace. He wasn't a man of war. You know, they say history is written by the victors. In South Africa, we haven't written our history. The memory of Tambo should really be cherished. He was a towering figure that activists like me looked up to, worshipped. He had great intellect, but he was also very down to earth, very simple, very humble. Oliver is uh, the greatest of the great. I now hand over to renowned poet, Puno Selesho, who has written a poem especially for this evening. Puno, over to you. I am Puno, Puno the poet. I invite you to understand my words and me. I've been told that I should have been born bitter and angry. In some spaces, I am too woman, too black. The words I utter, too woman, too black. But I say no. My words are birthed from the soil in my own chest. People keep digging graves with every phrase, but I'm planting flowers instead. I'm not angry. I am brave. I am not abrasive. I am determined. I am not too woman. I am woman enough. 
I am not too black. I am a dark chocolate delight. And I will work these words and toil the soil until the joy in my bones grows. Yeah, this tongue is sharp. And I will shape my own exceptional reality using only the finest materials like hope and humanity. What will your words be? Choose wisely. And let's use words that grow well here in South Africa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as has been introduced by Natasha, thank you so much for the introduction, um, as well as in my poem. My name is Funa Selesha and I am a poet. And it is a huge honor and a huge privilege to be here today with you um, virtually on your screens, in your homes, in your offices. Um, so thank you for being here and thank you for, for the invitation to, to be able to present and to, to open this incredible session, this incredible conversation with words. I believe words, I believe art is something that sets the tone for any, any space. Words in particular are like a seed that hopefully when put into the right soil will grow. Um, and these are my seeds. The words that I'm going to present to you written specifically for this event are the seeds that I'm, I'm inviting you into to take care of, to nurture and to grow. It is an invitation this poem into the world that we want to live in, into the, the reality that we want to work towards together. Uh, final thing that I'll say before I actually um, pre present the poem to you is that I love to see myself as an, an, as an artist who, who uses the words to almost lay the table. So today I'm laying the table with these words and I want us to gather around the table like, like we're having a family dinner and break bread, um, to, to break apart the words, to understand the words, to unpack it, to unpack the sentiment, to drink wine, to, to come together in unity. Because when we break bread, there is community, there is family, there is almost a common goal, a common essence. It feeds us so we become whole afterwards. And I want us to leave this table having a greater sense of direction, a greater sense of, of what we want for life, from life and what we're gonna do to get there. Um, I love the values of integrity, of humility that we've spoken about and just how principled everything that this foundation is about the the principles the values that's the stuff that i want us to engage with and get us stuck in with our fingers and problem solve and ask the hard questions and i hope this poem called the cost and value of vision is going to be the thing that sets the tone for exactly that so enjoy it open your ears open your mind open your heart Receive it. This is a gift to you. Um, and enjoy the meal. <laughs> the time will come when the righteous take part in harvest, for they have labored. It is with vision they have lived, with vision they have died. And now it is towards vision that we run and we rise. There is a hopeful dream embedded in our chests. It excites us. It wakes us and beckons us to face the challenges of each day. It bubbles over in speech, strengthens every bone and raises one to your feet when you fall. But vision will cost you. Our predecessors knew well the price tag of selflessness and sacrifice. Integrity asks much of you, but it rewards all in this life or the next. So do not let the burdening flame of hope die down in your chest. Cheap transactions for comfort and convenience will tempt you. But mediocrity will kill us faster than these hardships ever will. So stay the path. It is never in vain to plant and plow, to fight and yearn for more. We have seen the dawn of the dream, but the sun is yet to fully rise on a future where we are whole and healed. We were not created to endure. We were made to enjoy, but endure we must, climb we must, on conquest we must go so that one day we can return to who we really are, 
who we were always made to be free, unburdened, unashamed, living knowing we are worthy of all that is good. Therefore, stand firm on the foundation of principle. Be guided by the voice of your values. Pursue peace at every cost and never lose sight of those we are fighting for. The time will come when the righteous take part in harvest, for they have labored. It is with vision they have lived. With vision they have died. And now it is towards vision that we run and rise. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that was a good meal for you to indulge in. And I hope this has set the tone for a lovely evening of learning, of engaging, of asking the right questions, the hard questions, and for us moving forward. I look forward to building a South Africa we want, communities we want, and just being your fellow South African person. Have a really lovely evening. Enjoy. Bye now. He was respected because of his brilliant mind. When he presented to the United Nations, Africa felt proud. Independent Africa felt that's our leader. He was a supreme diplomat. Oliver Tambo was the father of the ANC for 30 or more years. There are not many people that can be trusted and faithful for 30 years. I'm insisting that with regard to all of these strategic interventions, which made the 1994 democratic victory possible, we had Oliver Tambo as a decisive leading and defining player. And for this reason, I have no hesitation to convey my heartfelt view to Oliver Tambo that we should bestow the title, the father of South Africa's democracy. I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, but I'm gonna do it so briefly because these are the most important things. She is a trustee of the Oliver and Adelaide Tumble Foundation. She is South Africa's High Commissioner to the UK. And most importantly, she is the daughter of the man we are honoring tonight. With that, I give you Ambassador Norma Temba Tumble. Good evening, everybody. It is such a pleasure, such an honor to be with you all this evening, celebra celebrating my father's uh, anniversary and uh, knowing that you are with us in love and to enjoy stories and memories of him and to acknowledge the many wonderful values, core values that he and my mother held and that have formed such a strong part of their, their legacy. So thank you very much indeed for this opportunity. Um, my job this evening is to introduce Lord Peter Hayne of Neath. Um, and I'm deliberately using his official title. He prefers to be known by his first name. But the reason I, I call him Lord Peter Hayne of Neath is because what I really want you to understand about this stunning man is that he is a man of community. Everything that I have noted about Peter comes from community. And he started his political career as it happens in Wales as an MP for me. And when he was honored by being made a life peer, he chose to be known as Lord Peter Hayne of Neath. And in fact, uh, for those of you who don't know, Neath is in Wales, which is where he lives. So when I talk about a man of community, I'm talking about a man who is deeply rooted in his community. He is loved and respected in his community in Wales, but that notion of community, he has taken everywhere not just for his um, private life. Peter's sense of community 
defines everything in my mind that he has done. Many of you will know that his fearless, successful protests, militant and very public, against all white South African sports tours meant that neither the United Kingdom nor Australia would see a South African sports tour until after 1994. He started those protests when he was a teenager and never stopped. What he did is he formed another community. He brought more people to join his cause. The cause was to fight against apartheid. He made the people of the United Kingdom aware that they need to stand up against injustice. Another community. I have to tell you too, that he has an enormous family. I was privileged enough to have been invited to one of his birthday parties. I couldn't believe it. They're like an army, um, but they all have the same sense of community togetherness. And you can see what he has birthed, what he has instilled in those. And he got that same feeling, that same commitment from his parents. Peter was born in Nairobi. His parents were both South African. So any way you want to look at it, he is an African through and through. And you can see it in the way in which he engages with people. You can see it in the way that he celebrates people. You can see it in the generosity of his spirit. You can see it in the brilliance of his mind. He has gone through British politics like a whirlwind, um, holding so many different positions. He is loved in the House of Commons, respected in the House of Commons. He has become part of the fabric of the House of Commons. And now he is part of the fabric of the House of Lords bringing people in to see, discuss, debate, taking people to task with respect, never forgetful of their dignity, exposing wrong consistently, courageously, no fear, no favor. This is the man who will be addressing us this evening. In 2017, Peter was awarded the Order of Companions of Oatumbo Award. He deserved it. He is one of those people that we as South Africans need to know more about. But I also have to tell you, he's a prolific writer. His latest book is called Boy from Pretoria. And I suggest you go and get it. What I would like to say is that He's written over 21 books. So you must know this is a man who has an incredibly active mind, a man who gives himself 100% to whatever it is he does. He's a man that we can all learn a great deal from. He is a man that we would all be happy to call friend. Peter says, if I'm going to do something, I'll do it, and he does. And he'll also tell you to your face, no, I can't. You can't get fairer than that. In this world of double speak, in this world where people tend to be somewhat unreliable, you can count on him. He's a sticker, he's a stayer, he's a man of honor and a man with a great sense of humor. I'm extremely fond of him. And he has supported me as he supports so many people, not just in the United Kingdom, but around the world with his strength and his wisdom and his generosity. So Peter, I'm handing over to you now and I cannot wait to hear what you have to share with us. Well, Tembi, um, thank you very much. I, I can't even begin to live up to that uh, very generous introduction, over generous. And it's great to have you as our High Commissioner from South Africa in Britain, which was, of course, uh, the center of the global anti-apartheid movement. And the British anti-apartheid movement was the most active, of course, where um, you were based uh, in Oliver and Ad Adelaide's family. Uh, and we've become very good friends. And it's a thrill to hear you this evening. 
It's also a great pr privilege to have followed such a fantastic poem uh, and a privilege to be delivering this lecture, especially when all the illustrious figures that had done so before were, were mentioned and I can't possibly uh, live up to them. The Undersung Hero was the title of my chapter for a 2007 book commemorating Oliver Tambo. Of course, he was never undersung to his close friends and his close comrade, Nelson Mandela, who, when he walked out of prison, publicly saluted my president, Oliver Tambo. The hundreds of millions across the world watching on television during those momentous days in February 1990 might have been forgiven for wondering why, who was his president? For the name Oliver Tambo did not trip off the tongue in, in, in a world enthralled by the courage, the resilience, and above all, the wisdom and dignity of Nelson Mandela, who'd spent nearly 10,000 days in the prime of his life in jail. But Madiba knew only too well what all of us involved in the bitterly hard decades of the anti-apartheid struggle, inside and outside South Africa did, that his own eventual freedom and that of his people owed so much to Oliver Tambo's leadership of the ANC during those 30 years of exile, based mainly in Lusaka, his family, like Tembi, in London. There I met O.R., saw him speak on platforms organized by the British anti-apartheid movement, and was struck by his modesty and old-fashioned sense of courtesy, soft-spoken and eloquent, rather than charismatic, austere rather than flamboyant, speaking with persuasion rather than oratory, exuding a steely, impressive, and powerful, but warming presence. Although Mandela was the iconic global figurehead of the freedom struggle, O.R. Tambo was actually the leader. After going into exile when the ANC was banned in 1960, and Mandela and other ANC leaders were forced to go underground and then dispatched to Robben Island. Their bond went back to the 1940s and remained unbreakable, despite the tensions and difficulties of communicating and consistent attempts by the regime to divide and rule and to manipulate. But what has always fascinated me most about OR is how he managed simultaneously to travel the world as suave suited diplomat, striding the corridors of international power and be guerrilla commander in chief in combat fatigues in the camps of Tanzania, Zambia and Angola respected everywhere by everyone, by prime ministers and presidents, by MP, MK cadres, and all in the international anti-apartheid movement. And having myself as British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, negotiated under Prime Minister Tony Blair the peace settlement that in 2007 brought together bitter old blood enemies, fiery unionist fundamentalist Ian Paisley and former IRA commander Martin McGuinness to share government together, I think OR's leadership should be a case study in conflict resolution. Take his statement on the 8th of January 1986, a hard line message broadcast and distributed clandestinely inside South Africa, and I quote, to intensify and transform the struggle into a real people's war, labeling Mkonto Wisizwe the people's army and exhorting the internal resistance to greater militancy against an unreformable apartheid system. Yet that very day at his headquarters in Lusaka, he was also embarking upon discreet diplomatic and political initiatives which would ensure that the ANC was prepared and indeed would dictate in future when the balance of forces determined it was time to talk with the enemy and its allies. Far-sighted as always, and at the very height of the insurrection, not as a sign of weakness, but of confident strength, 
He appointed a constitution committee to start drawing up constitutional guidelines for a future South Africa. Uniquely for a liberation movement, Tambo and the ANC leadership started planning purposefully, albeit very discreetly, for the eventuality of negotiations and a future constitutional dispensation. Tambo also in discreet organ communications with the imprisoned Mandela, understood that every war ends with the antagonists sitting around a table. Now, judging that the balance of power was beginning to turn decisively in favor of the long suffering disenfranchised majority, he decided that it was time to open up this new interlinked terrain of struggle. And when we observe the constitutional court upholding the rule of law, including it by imprisoning former President Zuma, and not many courts in the democratic world do that for their former presidents, we should remember that Tambo gave the instruction that the guidelines to be drawn up by the Constitution Committee had to ensure three things. National sovereignty, that is the transfer of power to the dispossessed so that they could decide their own futures, as well as a multi-party dispensation and system based on the protection of the individual rights of every South African. This latter point was strongly made as the ANC was determined to prevent at all costs a future model based upon group rights, which the regime and its allies at home and abroad favored as the way of protecting and reproducing entrenched apartheid privileges sometimes disguised as minority rights or de facto white privileges. Tambo was, was here laying the foundation for South Africa's much lauded Bill of Rights. He insisted also on the ANC actively promoting the broadest possible front against apartheid. So that when South Africa reached the, the stage of transition, the groundwork for a future national unity had been laid, expressly including in their campaign whites, as well as progressive elements in the then Bontestan structures. In parallel, both the jailed Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo tried to open up direct lines with the apartheid government, resulting in secret talks. At the same time, and aware that Margaret Thatcher was rushing to get involved and strategically far-sighted as always, Tambo moved to assemble a solid international coalition of forces to ensure that the constitutional guidelines for a democratic South Africa adopted by the ANC in 1988 formed the basis of any future settlement. So he was juggling these major geopolitical realignments and the unfolding internal changes, while at the same time attending to his regular job as commander in chief of Mkonto Risidwe. The former maths teacher and aspirant priest turned reluctant revolutionary who had succeeded in keeping the ANC together through nearly three harrowing de decades of exile was facing his greatest test yet. What Paolo Jordan recently called Tambo's genius and energy proved both far-sighted and decisive in isolating the regime, forcing it to release Mandela and to enter into substantive negotiations, effectively checkmating the regime politically and engineering a universal franchise, the transfer of power and an unlikely settlement of what had long been seen as one of the world's most intractable, most intractable political conflicts. He communicating regularly with Mandela through secret encrypted channels, carefully combined secret overtures and talks about talks with armed struggle, political mass mobilization, underground activity, and the coordination of international anti-apartheid actions to push the regime into a corner. Thus, under OR's sophisticated leadership, the ANC outmaneuvered its opponents 
determined to block true democracy, as well as managing to build constructive relations with key opposite negotiators and groups. For F.W. de Klerk and his allies at home and abroad, at the time believed that they could control the process and outmaneuver the liberation movements, including through security forces and third force violence to kill or destabilize ANC grassroots activists. But in a short four years, three centuries of white rule were formally annulled. South Africa got democracy and one of the most enlightened constitutions in the world which entrenched via its Bill of Rights and a constitutional court, the rule of law and the rights of every citizen. For a profound insight to all this, and for what he terms the documentary foundation stones of our democracy, I strongly recommend Andre Udendahl's forthcoming book, Dear Comrade President, How, El How Oliver Tambo Laid the Foundations for South Africa's Constitution done in close collaboration with Albi Sachs and to be published by Penguin Books early next year. Under Tambo's visionary, under Tambo's visionary leadership, Andre Udendahl insists, the oppressed wrested justice from history and managed to define the contours of their own destiny. Freedom was not given to them, they engineered and won it. Against all expectations and the run of history, South Africans have found a, resol a resolution to, hand to an historic conflict that had seemed unsolvable, fixed in granite, like Northern Ireland and Colombia were, and today still are Palestine, Kashmir, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, and others. Most people simply take for granted the fact that Northern Ireland, leaving aside isolated attacks by small and isolated paramilitary factions and the current damaging, deeply damaging Brexit repercussions is now more at peace with itself than ever before. After a conflict created many centuries ago and sharpened by terrorism, brutal violence, terrible bitterness, sectarianism, discrimination and prejudice. Yet the 2007 settlement that I helped negotiate offered some guiding principles which underpinned the British Labour government strategy from 1997 and which alongside studying Oliver Tambo's sophisticated leadership and the ANC strategy could be applied to resolving conflicts elsewhere. First of all, our peacemaking framework in Northern Ireland did not simply address ancient Irish constitutional divisions. It tackled human rights, equality, victims, and ending discrimination against Catholics in jobs and housing. It was these bread and butter issues and impartial policing, prisoner releases, and decommissioning of weapons which had threatened the peace process on so many occasions before. Dealing with them helped create more space for political leaders, for politics to be more flexible. Second, people and personalities matter in politics. And that building relationships of trust, even where deep differences remain, is vital. So too is understanding rather than being judgmental about the pressures, the pressures on the protagonists from within their own community or organization, whether these were IRA-linked political leaders in Sinn Féin or fundamentalist unionists of the Democratic Unionist Party. Being an honest broker was essential in a way that had not been the case before, uh, for Britain before, and has sadly not been the case since the Conservatives took power in 2010 and have effectively sided consistently with unionist parties. Boris Johnson's hardline Brexit agenda further destabilizing the peace process and its political stability. Third, it's necessary to take risks. 
For example, under the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, releasing prisoners who had committed unspeakable atrocities. Although not easy, this was essential to show paramilitary groups that a commitment to peace brought gains which could not be achieved uh, in other ways, could not be achieved uh, through uh, violence. Fourth, international forces needed to be aligned. Tony Blair came to power in 1997 to find a strong, confident Irish government led by Bertie Ahern and a United States president in Bill Clinton who felt a strong personal attachment to Ireland and who was influenced by the large and politically significant Irish American community. Crucially, crucially, all three were prepared to work to a shared strategy and each was prepared to be bold. This had never happened before. And as other parts of the world like Palestine, Israel have discovered, these alignments of leadership and circumstance do not come along often. And failure to seize the opportunity can mean condemning another generation to conflict. Fifth, over Northern Ireland negotiations, we considered it vital to avoid or resolve preconditions to dialogue. However, in South Africa's case, Tambo and the ANC managed through the Harare Declaration and getting it endorsed by the frontline states, the Organization of African Unity, the Non-Aligned Movement, the Commonwealth, and finally the UN General Assembly and Security Council to outmaneuver and isolate the apartheid government by early on laying down preconditions which ensure genuine change rather than obstructive negotiations and rather than more delays and more apartheid reform, which had only, which had only the, the maintenance of white supremacy as a goal. In the Middle East, both sides have imposed preconditions, effectively blocking any dialogue from beginning strangling the peace process at birth. In the early years of the IRA's bloody campaign, nobody in the British government could stomach talking with Republican leaders, except in surrender terms, since terrorist attacks on London and Birmingham, let alone on the island of Ireland, had placed them completely beyond the pale. Yet in the middle of all of this bloodshed and mayhem, contact was initiated which much later on came to fruition. And it's true that enter into, entering into dialogue, especially secret dialogue with, paramil with paramilitary groups, carries risks for democratic government. It did for the British governments over Northern Ireland, and it always will. But there is no alternative. As Tony Blair's chief of staff, Jonathan Powell, who played a key role in the Good Friday peacemaking program, explains in his excellent book, Talking to Terrorists, you have to negotiate with them, offering both inducements and, when necessary, tough deterrence. Six, it was Tony Blair's great virtue to grip and micromanage the Irish conflict at the highest level in a way that no British prime minister had ever done, not intermittently, but continuously, daily, whatever breakdown crises and anger got in the way. By contrast, sadly, in the Middle East, efforts and initiatives have come and gone, mostly according to the United States presidential cycle, and violence has returned to fill the vacuum. Fly in, fly out diplomacy has failed. Periodic engagement has led to false starts and dashed hopes. International forces have not been aligned and dialogue has been stunted. But Hamas and Israel cannot militarily defeat each other. They will each have to be party with each other to a negotiated solutions, to a negotiated solution which satisfies both Israel's need for security and Palestinian aspirations for a viable state. If indeed that is still possible, given Israel's balkanization of the West Bank through illegal settlements, 
and occupying controls. And if it is no longer possible, then what? Similar issues arose over the Taliban in Afghanistan. Instead of cultivating only Afghan forces and individuals amenable to the United States from 2001, instead of occupying a country that has always rejected foreign invaders from Britain in the 1830s to the Soviets in the 1980s, surely after 9-11, the West should have negotiated a deal with the Taliban to remove Al-Qaeda instead of barging in, staying for 20 years, then fleeing ignominiously. In Kashmir, supporting efforts to take forward negotiations between Delhi and Islamabad is the imperative. Here, perhaps the lessons are also that a seemingly irre irreconcilable conflict can be addressed with ingenuity. The expansion of Irish cross-border structures between Northern Ireland, that is, and the Republic of Ireland, and the devolution of policing and justice to, to Northern Ireland government away from British control was crucial to Irish Republicans agreeing to share power in what remains still a devolved part of the British state they disowned and still do. If India, Pakistan, and the Kashmiris themselves can agree to an entity with soft borders and greater autonomy for Kashmiris on both sides of the line of control between both states, then maybe progress could be made while preserving the interests and long-term objectives of each. But the inescapable lesson of Northern Ireland, and which Oliver Tambo intuitively understood in practice, is that even the deepest conflicts are in the end political and usually end in negotiation. The challenge for political leaderships embroiled in conflict is to avoid further bloodshed and devastation by moving earlier rather than later to talk rather than to fight a war neither can win militarily. I hope Northern Ireland will be an inspiration to those parts of the world that cannot yet even see as far as the starting point, that they too can one day enjoy the triumph of humanity in the long transition from horror to hope. Like South Africa did so movingly in 1994, even, it has got, even if it has gone from hero in those days to zero now, still in hangover, from the prodigious looting, corruption, and money laundering of the Zuma presidency, which so tragically betrayed the legacy of Oliver Tambo and his commitment to integrity, social justice, and equal opportunities for all. Can I end by thanking the Tambo Foundation for this great privilege and adding that I was both surprised and proud suddenly to be informed in 2015 uh, as that I'd been awarded the order of the companion, uh, companions of O.R. Tambo uh, for uh, my excellent contribution to the freedom struggle, receiving it at a moving ceremony in the presidential guest house that December. And I'm proudly wearing uh, the miniature medal now uh, that was presented to me uh, amongst other things at that occasion. It's been a singular honor another singular honor to deliver this talk, a luta continua, because the struggle for freedom and justice never ends, not in South Africa, nor anywhere else in the world. And we must continue it, not least to uphold the legacy of Oliver Tambo. Thank you very much to the foundation and thank you to all of you who joined this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Lord Hain, which I'm still going to call you because Peter just doesn't work for me. <laughs> I now <laughs> hand over to Luando Tasso, who's going to, for the rest of the evening, be in conversation with Lord Hain, um, tackling some of the topics he touched on in his speech. Luando obtained her law degree from the University of Johannesburg in 2005. Thereafter, she started her articles and practice at Norton Rose Fulbright. 
She then pursued a master's in constitutional and administrative law at the University of Cape Town, where she worked as a researcher. In 2011, she had the privilege of clerking at the Concord for Justice Edwin Cameron. Also in 2011, she contributed to the book One Law, One Nation, which is a book on the history of South Africa's constitution. She also frequently writes on topics of constitutional law, history and culture for the Daily Maverick and various other publications. In 2012, she was awarded the Franklin Thomas Fellowship by the Concord, by the Concord Trust rather, to study at the University of Notre Dame, where in 2013, she received an LLM in international law, graduating magna cum laude. In 2013, she worked as a senior researcher for the Public Service Remuneration Review Commission, tasked with the transformation of the public service and was a researcher to the former Chief Justice Sandile Ngobo. Currently, she works with the Constitutional Hill Trust, focusing primarily on projects such as the Museum of the Constitution, which is currently under development. She is also a trustee of the Constitutional Court Trust and the founder and owner of Including Society, which is a forum established to explore issues around cultural justice, belonging, and, a, and inclusion. Most recently, she is the author of Made in South Africa, a Black woman's story of rage, resistance, and progress, which is thankfully available in bookstores all over. Luanda, I'm so excited to have you. I know Lord Hain was very worried that you were going to be very hard on him. I would say don't hold back, but it is up to you. I hand over to you for what I know will be a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Natasha. And um, thank you to the Oliver and Adelaide Tumble Foundation for having me. Thank you to you, Lord Hain, but I will call you Peter uh, for your uh, very reflective remarks on the man that we are commemorating today. And I guess I wanna say first, happy 104th eternal birthday to Oliver Reginald Tambo. As Mandela said in his eulogy uh, at Oliver Tambo's funeral, let us, let all of us who live say that while we live, Oliver Tambo will not die. May you for your part forever rest in peace. Um, you know, every time I think of, you know, Tambo's legacy, I think of what Albie Sachs likes to say, that if we had to perform a DNA test on the constitution, you know, uh, whose paternity would our constitution have? And he always says that uh, it would be Oliver Tambo's. And being a constitutional lawyer, I think the more we reflect on Tambo's legacy, the more I realize that what Albi has been saying is so true, that he's really one of our founding fathers. One of the most powerful things that rings in my head when I think of Tambo's legacy is a clip in uh, one of the documentaries produced by the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation. Have you heard from Johannesburg? And there's a part where he says, um, the eighties would be the last decade of apartheid, right? There's something in that pronouncement, you know, in his knowing, in his boldness, in his resolution to declare that this would be the last 10 years of apartheid. And I feel like that is so unfamiliar today, those pronouncements. It's kind of like if we had to say today that this would be the last year of load shedding, right? And we mean it. And we resolute towards working towards that, uh, fulfilling that prophecy. And I guess what I want to know from you, uh, Peter, is what one skill do you think Tambo possessed in abundance that allowed him to fulfill his own prophecy of saying that this would be the last decade of apartheid? I suppose vision and leadership. Um, and these things, leadership especially, is a very tough business. And, and great leaders like or don't come around very often. But it, I, when I was preparing for the lecture and talking to my close friend, Andre Rudendahl, whose, uh, whose book I mentioned, and I hope maybe can give a lecture on it, um, 
uh, as L.B. Sachs has done, with whom he works closely. Uh, I, I was just very struck about his multifaceted personality. So I don't know about one skill, but it's a combination of leadership, which is, is a difficult thing. And I always make the distinction when talking about leadership and teaching, as I do at, um, at Gibbs, uh, that, that uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's easy to, to be a leader who just follows what, what he or she expects people, thinks people want of them. But Boar showed leadership beyond that. There he was, uh, planning for the new constitution, planning for the negotiations, at the same time as uh, being the guerrilla commander of MP. And, and this, this is, these kind of skills on, are very rarely found in one person. To actually have their credibility as a guerrilla commander amongst his army, because that's effectively what it was. And at the same time, the credibility uh, of those in the UDF and the MDM in the 1980s engaged in internal resistance. Um, uh, and, uh, and also then to walk into any prime minister's or president's office who would open a door to him. And of course, Margaret Thatcher wouldn't remember that. And, 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 uh, and, and President Reagan wouldn't. Um, and that was the case for a lot of presidents and prime ministers around the world, Scandinavian countries like Sweden's Olaf Palmer being a, an honorable exception. You know, to, to combine these two things and to have credibility to both, in a sense, constituencies is an amazing uh, simultaneous act of leadership. I couldn't agree more. It's so rare. And um, as we know, in, in, in Tambo's young life, you know, as a young person, he immersed himself in sports, in culture, in music, in um, his spiritual beliefs. He started student organizations. He was a deputy head boy. And I think all of that, including his home life, prepared him for the life that he would later lead as an activist. And I guess in the same vein, I'd like to hear from you. What do you think prepared you for your life at 19? to be able to lead a part of the resistance against apartheid from London? Well, of course, I was just one of uh, people that I found myself in a, in a leading position in the Stop the 70 Tour campaign in 1969-70, when having come up with the idea of militant nonviolent action to invade the pitches of the Springboks and, and stop the cricket tour. And um, as, uh, as, as, as was said in the introduction, those um, those tours never happened again to Britain or to Australia for another 20 years. And then a few years later, the same battle was won in, in, um, in New Zealand. So I think, I think it's important to recognize that we, were all, we all played parts. Oliver Tambo as our leader, effectively, in the international anti-apartheid struggle. But what I learned from him was humility, um, you know, not, I hope, uh, people... I think ego gets in the way of leadership very often. And Oliver Tambo never seemed to me when I met him or I saw him speak on platforms in London, mostly organized by the anti-apartheid movement, sometimes by the ANC in London as well. I never thought there was somebody who was out for himself. He was out for us, for the movement, for the people. And um, that was an inspiration and I learned a lot from it. And uh, I hope that I've, I've applied it in both that struggle in 1969-70 and, and my wider activism supporting the leaders of the British anti-apartheid movement. Um, but, you know, sometimes you find yourself in situations, um, sometimes you find yourself in situations that you have to live up to. I didn't expect to be leading that campaign. I'd come up with the idea of direct action to stop the tours, but I didn't expect to be the leader when I helped organize others um, uh, much more senior and work with people much more senior than me. But, you know, that's how it happened. But, you know, I think um, for those who don't have the benefit of your background, what was it about your personal life 
you know, uh, your home life, your schooling life that you think prepared you at such an early age to be able to have that confidence of taking on in your own way the apartheid state? Well, I have to salute the memory of my parents, Adelaide and Walter Hayden, because when I lived in Pretoria, and, and my book is uh, my new memoir, which is recently out in South Africa, published by Jonathan Ball, called A Pretoria Boy. Um, my parents were the main activists in the 90, early 1960s in Pretoria because the ANC and the POC had been banned, uh, its leaders suppressed. Uh, and my mom and dad worked very closely with ANC figures like Peter Mahano in, uh, in Pretoria and others. But I learned there the, the values that I hope that I've continued to uh, follow all through my life. And, and, and those were values of, of justice and integrity and courage and, and in my mom and dad's case, self-sacrifice. Now they always said, well, they didn't, um, they were, you know, they were foot soldiers, they didn't sacrifice, they sacrificed far little, they did far less than the big figures of, of the struggle like Oliver and Adelaide, like Nelson and Willie, Joe Slovo, Ronnie Casserules, you could re read off a long list of the real heroes. My mom and dad never saw them or sought to be portrayed in that way, but they showed a lot of courage. And they stuck to what they believed, even though it meant that they were jailed and banning, were banned and had to leave the country of their birth with us as young kids, um, which we didn't want to do and go to exile in London. So I think learning those values. And then one other thing, Luando, that sticks in my mind. I remember as a little boy meeting Alan Payton, mm. the author of Cry the Beloved Country, who was then president of the Liberal Party of South Africa, which... Uh, in the early 60s was the only non-racial um, anti-apartheid organization because the Progressive Party of Helen Sussman, and Helen played a very important role in the struggle, as Nelson Mandela acknowledged, it was not committed to universal franchise. So the Liberal Party was the main anti-apartheid um, organization in the early 60s. The others haven't been banned. And I remember meeting um, Alan Payton, its president, and him saying something which really stuck with me. He said, Peter, I'm not an all or nothing person. I'm an all or something person. Mm. And I thought a lot about that as I got involved in politics years later and thought a lot about it because you can try to achieve everything and achieve nothing, or you can actually try to achieve specific things whilst part of a broader ambition and a broader vision. And that's why I focused on the sports campaign. So. Those are the kind of things I learned from my upbringing in, the, in following my parents and supporting my parents in, in Pretoria in, in the early 60s. And we're going to get uh, to the sports campaign because there's an aspect of it that I'd like to understand. But for those who are joining us, uh, I'm in conversation with Lord Peter Hain. Our conversation is gonna span the legacy of Oliver Tambo to South Africa today state capture, vaccine apartheid, and all those issues that are bubbling under. Um, but just to get back to your parents, um, I know that they were, sorry, they were jailed in 1961 for their anti-apartheid activism. Uh, and then they were issued with banning orders in 1963, and eventually in 1966, because the apartheid government had made it so hard for your father to be able to work in South Africa, you left the country for the UK. And one thing that stuck out to me is that um, you said at some point that your father said to you that you are moving for good. This is not just a temporary relocation. You're going to be making a home in the UK. However, he firmly believed that apartheid would be defeated. He knew that it would take a long time, but eventually it would be defeated. What do you think, you know, at the height of repression? I mean, the 1960s were a dark period in, in, in South Africa. Shovel had just happened. Leaders had been jailed. People had gone into exile. I mean, at that point, you would think that the beast that was apartheid had had the final say. What do you think in that moment gave your father confidence saying that we will defeat apartheid? Well, he believed he was always very, very realistic. And... Uh... You know, there was he was never given to find a flowery sort of uh, language or 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 I you know romanticism if if you like. 
Um, but he always thought it would ultimately collapse under the, under the pressure of its own contradictions, but he didn't think that would have happened early. And it was, of course, a quarter of a century before the, the process really started to, to escalate. But you're right um, towards transition, but you're right in that period that you spoke about when my parents were most, were most active and we went into exile, you know, it was, the resistance had been closed down. Um, it was it was being reorganized under OR um, and the anti-apartheid movement in Britain was very active, but you know, all the leadership were on Robben Island or had been tortured or oppressed or, um, or silenced or banned or house arrested like Helen Joseph, for example the great the hero of the struggle. Uh, so it was a dark time and it was not really until Soweto um, in 1976 and the uprising by the school students and then the, the, the reaction of the, of the state and the, the, the resistance to that and the explosions in the townships that actually it began to escalate again and build towards the 1980s. So it was a tough time. And my, so my dad, on the one hand, I think was right to say, we will eventually defeat apartheid, but he thought it would take a long time. And he said to us, and you know, it really, it really hit home to me. He said, make a new, uh, a new life in your new country of Britain, uh, which is what I did. And otherwise I wouldn't have ended up as a member of parliament for a quarter of a century, 12 years in, in the British government, and then sitting in, the House of Lords, which, by the way, I think should be elected, um, but that's another debate. Uh, so um, I, I think it was because he said, we will, I still am optimistic, but you've got to get stuck into your new community because exile is very tough. Mm. I'm sure, I'm sure Tembi uh, will, will agree with that. People come into exile had a really, really tough team, tough time. A lot of because you had, you were uprooted from everything, and a lot of people um, had serious mental health issues. A lot of people fell into alcoholism. Um, uh, you know, others stayed very strong, but it was a tough, tough time. As as Hilda Bernstein wrote in in her book about interviews with portraits of different of different anti-apartheid activists. Mm. And I just want to say to our viewers at home, I see your questions coming in. I will get to them uh, and keep them coming. Um, you mentioned earlier on Albie Sachs, who is someone I also have the honor of uh, working with currently, and he's also the trustee of the Tambo Foundation. One of the things that, again, that he says that, um, you know, I keep replaying in my mind is that, you know, the only good thing to come from apartheid is anti-apartheid. You know, that sense of global comradeship, community, and the love that emerges when people are unified by a cause, right? In a time of difficulty. What emerges for you when you hear that sentiment from Albi? And what would you say? I know we spend a lot of time discussing the cost and the sacrifice of struggle, right? Of resistance. What gift have you found in your life of resistance? Well, Albie is such a hero and inspiration and, and always was to me, uh, to my parents, um, whom he knew uh, and has done such amazing things um, and still, you know, continues to proclaim the true values of, of the struggle. And the struggle continues. You know, I ended up by saying Aluta Continua because <laughs> you know, the struggle is not over. Apartheid's legacy is still deeply embedded in the society. And, uh, you know, you have to keep pushing forward. You have to, you can never kind of just stand still. That's what I've also learned um, in my 50 plus years in politics is that you think you've achieved something, you know, there are lots of criticisms to be made about our, uh, our Labour government, first under Tony Blair, then, then Gordon Brown, the principal one, Iraq. But um, it was just so uh, terrible to see all the public investment and achievements that we had had delivered you know uh, building up the health service which had been run right down under the conservatives uh, investing in education and lots of other things i could recite to you and then seeing it being progressively destroyed destroyed by 10 mm -hmm. years of conservative neoliberal austerity you know that just underlines that you've got to keep pressing for keep demanding 
of this ANC government in South Africa uh, keep demanding better and more um, mm. uh, and so on. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's an important uh, part of my answer to your question as well. Thank you so much. And I think you've answered one of our viewers' questions, Elaine Velozo, who says, do you think today that the real meaning of apartheid has already been defeated? Well, I think I have answered yeah. that. And, and the answer yeah, I hope is you caught no. that answer. <laughs> but, but having said that, Elaine, you know, when I come back to South Africa, and, and don't underestimate this, when I come back and I experience the South Africa today, compared with the South Africa I left as a 16 year old in 1966. It is as a bright day compared with a dark night. Mm. With, for the, all that is wrong, with all that is wrong, uh, you know, Luando, somebody of your great ability would not have been able to achieve what the position you've achieved um, in, uh, in, in, in your own um, life uh, today. Uh, and when I, when I teach, as I do at Gibbs uh, on leadership and conflict resolution and other subjects, um, MBA students, uh, I see they're incredibly talented young people, uh, mostly uh, black, as it happens. It's multiracial, but mostly black. Now, that was inconceivable to have those students <laughs> learning a business degree. And you can, you know, you can multiply that a thousand times for all that's wrong. And for all that still has to be improved, I'm not just talking about the corruption, I'm talking about you know, overcoming generations of, of uh, apartheid's legacy going back to British colonial times and before. You know, a massive amount has been achieved. Mm. And, and I think uh, leaders like OR would, on the one hand, be dismayed by the, by the corruption, particularly under the Zuma decade, but frankly, still present in its cancerous form, they would be dismayed, but they'd also be proud um, mm. of, of what has been achieved. I think as I hear you speak, I, I feel you invoking your father's spirit, but in a different sense that it may take a long time, but we will perfect our constitutional democracy. It feels like you have that optimism that whatever the challenge of the day is, it will be defeated and we will overcome it. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, I, I, if, you're, if you're a radical activist, as I still am, if you're a socialist like I am, you know, you want to, you want to keep seeing a change. And my dad said something very profound to me when I was a boy. He said, mm. if change was easy, it would have happened a long time ago. Mm. Change is really hard. Mm. You know, mm. all of you in whatever jobs you do, whatever family roles you play in, you, in your personal life, change is hard. Nobody likes change. We all feel discomforted by it. And, and so you just got to keep pushing for it in, in the right way. And speaking of change, I want to get to our transition from apartheid into a constitutional democracy. You know, um, many of my generation and younger, we take for granted, you know, um, that transition and those negotiations. You know, we label it as selling out. You know, um, I see we have a comment from Zizi Lamini who says, I have a strong feeling that we were deceived by agreeing to negotiations. We were not compensated for what we went through. Why? Yet liberals and a few selected are enjoying the fruits of negotiations. I don't think we are independent. I'd like you, maybe for you to share from that global perspective, what were the global realities that Oliver Tambo and um, the leaders of that time you know, what were they facing? You know, what was the broader context that perhaps people of my generation and younger can maybe understand negotiations a little bit better? Or do you think, as uh, Zizipo has stated here, that by agreeing to negotiate, that there is a sense that we sold out and it has only benefited a select few? Well, this is a very profound question. And of course, it's right on the, on the button in terms of a lot of the debate, um, particularly amongst radical critic, critics of uh, Mandela and Tambo and that incredible generation of, of leaders, Walter Sisulu uh, and many others. Um, I, I kind of sort of semi-answered the question by just giving a hint in my lecture 
of the for formidable obstacles and opposition, powerful forces against OR and the ANC and the international anti-apartheid movement uh, at the time. And let me just, as it were, in, in, in parenthesis, in brackets, just pause for a moment and say, as I, as I mentioned in passing, you know, the anti-apartheid movements across the world are now kind of saluted as having succeeded. But, it, you know, we were a minority. It was really hard stuff. Personally, I was vilified and attacked and a lot of threats made to, to me, but um, at the time, particularly of the Stop the Tour campaigns. But, you know, the, the anti-apartheid movement's headquarters was, was fire, um, had an arson attack on it. It was bugged, including by the British intelligence services. The ANC uh, office in London was firebombed by the apartheid security services, who, by the way, were never the secret agents from BOSS, the British uh, the apartheid security force at the time. They were never hounded down by the police. <laughs> the police at the time were infiltrating our movements and mm. bugging and so putting under surveillance people like me. So what, when I, I, I say that because I think it's really important historically and for critics uh, such as you quoted and, and, and I, I, pay, I you know, I'm respect the, their point of view, to just understand the might of the forces ranged against the ANC at the time. Not just internally, and I'll come to that, but externally. You know, you had powerful figures like Margaret Thatcher seeking to thwart OR's strategy of genuine mm. uh, one person, one vote constitutional democracy instead of a, a, a tyranny uh, under apartheid. You had the forces of international capital right behind that agenda. And of course, they had the ability to switch off investment into South Africa, to pull out uh, and to stop further investment, which would have been very, very damaging. So that's the external situation. And they, of course, had also, you know, they had armed the apartheid government. They had continued to do so right towards the end. They traded with the apartheid government whilst, you know, uh, sort of expressing their alleged dis dislike for apartheid at the United Nations and elsewhere. In practice, they were talking with a forked tongue. Those were the international forces. The ANC was not, and the ANC leadership at the time was not kind of isolated from those international pressures, those global pressures. And then inside, just remember, you know, the economy was run by the white minority. Yeah. The white minority controlled the police. They controlled the, the security forces and they unleashed those forces in the period of transition between 1990 and 1994 to deadly effect. More yeah. people were killed in that period, that four year period, I just remind everybody, than at any time under apartheid. There was a really big battle going on. And then, you know, so, so the ANC was in a powerful position and OR had managed to kind of engineer international forces so that the ANC's hand was strengthened, but it was still not nearly as powerful uh, in terms of sheer state power uh, and in terms of global opposition uh, and in terms of the economy. Um, it was still in a, you know, in, in, you know, in a, it had the ability, the ANC, to disrupt and to destroy and to make ungovernable the society and to cause economic damage to the point where international capital was had turned away from South Africa. But it couldn't, um, it couldn't have, uh, yeah, somebody, oh, David Kenvins just said, a fellow anti apartheid movement activist and a very important role in the struggle, he just said, I think, 10,000 people were killed and only 100 were white in those four years. Mm. So that what was going on was a, a war of murder against uh, Tambo and Mandela's followers. So that was the reality. Now just look at, um, and then I'll come to where, by, way, by the way, in a moment, where I think the criticism is to be made. And I'm sorry if uh, it's a long answer, but it's such an no, important no. issue. Definitely. Then look at those societies that did, where negotiation didn't take place where there was a sudden transition from uh, colonial rule in this case, and I've picked two examples, 
uh, Portuguese colonial rule in Angola and and um, uh, and Mozambique, there was a sudden transition when the dictatorship fell in Portugal and the, the Portuguese colonialists suddenly pulled out. And what happened then? Civil wars, terrible civil wars destroyed those countries. You know, um, landmines everywhere in Angola. And both those countries, Mozambique more than Angola, which has got immense natural, natural wealth, both of those countries were badly destroyed in a way that South Africa never was. And it wouldn't have been just the whites suffering. Uh, the whites would have left or whatever. It is actually some the majority. Did. But, mm -hmm. And did. I'm saying some did. Some, some did. did. And, and some still Growing are. up in, in the early 90s, the bodies that I remember burning in the street were black bodies, you know? Exactly. Exactly. It's a point David Kenvin makes and, and I was... I was making in the, that, that period of transition. So this was a tough transformation. And personally, I think the ANC leadership, I think OR, I think Madiba, I think everybody, whether it's Joe Slover or Ronnie Castrols or, or all of that leadership, did the right thing. Where I think historically and in retrospect, there was a mistake, is not to begin the process of economic transformation in a much deeper and more fundamental way. So, um, you know, but it's easy for me to say that. And it's much easier for young radical critics. And I understand their impatience because I was once a young radical critic and I'm now an old radical critic of, uh, you know, of the state of Britain for the, at the moment, which is pretty dire, but that's another story entirely. Um, you know, I, I think a much more systematic process and strategy uh, of... Um, uh, of economic transformation should have been initiated at that stage. Black economic empowerment, yes, empowered a new black uh, middle class and made you know the uh, run billionaires of of uh, of of a number of, of of black business people in a way that there were plenty of of white billionaires. Uh, and but I mean, what it didn't do is is and it's very hard to do, very very hard to do in a in a neoliberal global capitalist order to make the economic transformation. And of course, then the efforts that were made by Madiba and under Taubo and Becky to, 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 to build millions of houses and, and bring millions uh, electricity and running water and all those incredible achievements. And by the way, run an economy with high growth rates uh, compared with the apartheid era and high investment yeah. compared with the apartheid era and unemployment coming down, was then just um, absolutely sabotaged under Zuma. I'm, fr I'm very blunt about it, but that's what I think happened. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I really think that your answer to that question is so important because I feel like we haven't even started to critically think about that period and to fully unpack it. So I really do appreciate that. And just being mindful of time, I just wanna go back you know, to, to some of your personal you know, uh, contributions to the struggle and your activism, which is captured in your book, Pretoria Boy, the story of South Africa's public enemy number one. You know, when I read that last part, for someone who was militant, but didn't necessarily take up arms, you know, you were not, uh, a, a violent activist. Uh, what earned you that moniker of South Africa's public enemy number one? Well, it was a moniker um, decided and, and, and a label attached to me by the white media in South Africa. And basically it began when we started in disrupting the Springboks and I was the public face of the campaign. And of course, as a former Pretoria boy, I was a traitor to the white um, uh, the white folk <laughs> that were were running and benefiting from apartheid. So I think they they hated me because I was stopping their sport, and they cared a lot about sport. When I say I was stopping their sport, not on my own. We had thousands of anti-apartheid activists, some of whom I see listed: uh, people like Bob Newland and uh, uh, and um, and David Kenvin and others on on in involved in this this fantastic event. You know, there were thousands of us, but I happened to be the public face of it. 
And that's and they hated me for it. And then when we won, when we stopped the cricket tour and we which followed the Springbok campaign, it was it, it was about the only victory. Uh, the only victories that were happening in the anti-apartheid cause, actual complete victories, were on the sports front. Uh, white South Africa was expelled from the Olympics as a result of the, the struggle of the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee, led by former Dennis um, uh, Robert Island, uh, prisoner Dennis Brutus and Chris De Brolio, former weightlifting cha champion of South Africa, and John Harris, who was the chair of San Rock until he was banned. Uh, in 1964, and then ultimately he was hanged um, for his contribution to the struggle. The only white to be hanged. So you know, it was it was the sports campaign at that stage where the biggest victories were achieved. And then, you know, the British anti-apartheid movement's uh, membership more than doubled. I think trebled at one point after the stop the tour campaigns. Then it was stronger to, stronger to go on and drive Barclays Bank out of out of um, uh, out of Britain, out of South Africa to disinvest. So, but the public enemy number one was because white South Africa was allegedly shunned around the world because of apartheid in the apartheid era. But it was fated at Twickenham. The Springboks were the cricket team was fated at Lord's Cricket Ground, given lavish hospitality, treated as you know wonderful people, and yet. They were there under a complete false falsity, which was that was white South Africa, never South Africa. Mm. And I know you've been asked this question before, but I want to put it on this record. Um, what would you say to the South Africans who hated you, you know, for crushing the rugby and cricket tours, uh, but applaud you for ex exposing a corrupt ANC, you know, today? Well, when I was asked, by the way, by brave. Um, ANC leaders like Kravian Gordon, and I, I salute his role in all of this, and a, a, a person of incredible integrity and courage. When I was asked by Pravin and others uh, in 2017, on, on, when teaching in Johannesburg, to um, expose the international complicity to corruption, the money laundering, the, the global corporates, the HSBCs, the Standard Chartered, the Bank of Rhodes, the KPMGs and McKinsey and all that, that, that sort of long line of, of corporate villains that, that were part of the Zuma and Gupta looting. Um, when I was asked to do that under parliamentary privilege in the House of Lords, which I did, um, and I explained this all in, in my book, The Pretoria Boy, uh, I then got a whole lot of emails, and I think you're referring to this, Rwanda, <laughs> saying thank you very much, by a whole lot of whites, by the way, um, saying thank you very much for exposing the corruption, but we hated you for what you did uh, to the Springboks. And I, I replied back and I said, but thank you very much, but just understand the same values that propelled me to be active with many others in the anti-apartheid struggle are the same values to uphold the virtue, the, the, to uphold the legacy of that struggle of integrity and justice and equal opportunities, not selfishness and greed, like was happening under uh, uh, all, the, all the looting and the corruption. Um, and uh, the same values that you hated me for then uh, are the same values that I still, and I don't apologize for that at all. I'm proud of what we did in the Stop the Tour campaign, but I still get white South Africans, you know, on media programs calling in to say they hate, still hate me. There you are, you know, uh, mm. I don't mind uh, because I think that history vindicated us. Mm. Definitely. Um, and, and, you know, speaking of looting and corruption, I want to focus on state capture. You know, uh, you have been at the forefront of exposing the criminality of the Guptas and the involvement of global banks in state capture. You know, in preparation for this talk, I, I read, we read your, your submissions. Obviously, I was aware at the time of, um, you know, what it was you would be submit, submitting to the, the, the commission. But I have to say that I couldn't fully be plugged into the commission of inquiry into state capture, the Zonda commission. I would dip in and out only because it was too painful to listen to it every day. And emotionally, you know, it was devastating 
It was traumatic, not just to me, but for so many people. And I just wanted to, to find out from you the emotional impact of finding out, you know, um, the details, the depth of the plunder and corruption that was denying so many people the realization of their human rights. You know, having been someone who fought against apartheid because you were fighting for the realization of the human rights of all South Africans and now at the hands, you know, of a government that we thought would deliver on those promises that were stealing from the people. Emotionally, what did that do to you? Because I know for me, I couldn't, I couldn't absorb all of that. Well, Luanda, it was very painful because, you know, I had been, as, as my parents were over the decades, uh, a steadfast supporter of the ANC. And people like OR and Madiba and Walter Sisulu and Governor Berkey and all those figures were, were heroes to me. You know, I was a foot soldier in the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, uh, and, and they were kind of on, a, on an entirely different level. And here was an ANC president um, leading a betrayal of all of those values. So it was, it was very personal. And when I was asked to do something about it, um, you, you know, and when I had, as I, des I describe in, in the book, both what really went on, but also I had a deep throat source inside the, I, I refer to that person, her or him, I never identify. I'll never even say whether it's just one person, but a deep throat source or sources. Um, that it was it was painful because of the, the sense of betrayal, but also because you know South Africa, and I still still think it does, but certainly in those years under uh, under Mandela and 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 the Berkey, South Africa was an example to the rest of the world. It wasn't perfect. Madiba himself. You know, in, during his presidency, was pointing out mm. the dangers of corruption, and I, and I quote this, and saying it was happening. But you know, it was an example to the world of how to do something to transform evil into hope, um, an opportunity for all, an example to the world. And then it became an example to the world of something else, uh, which was you know the very opposite. Um, and that's why I said gone from hero to zero. So, mm. but you know, having said that, it's to its credit that it has a commission of inquiry. I mean, under COVID in Britain, all sorts of dodgy contracts were given to friends of ministers. I haven't seen any commission of inquiry into that yet. Um, so, I mean, the scale of looting in, in under Zuma was just prodigious. It was industrial. And I always make the point. The trouble with that is it's not only, in a sense, immoral, which it is, but actually what it does is it stops houses being built. It stops job creep being created. It stops better schools being invested in and, and, and hospitals that are needed. You know, that's, that's the cost of it all. And, and perhaps this is the part where I will be a little bit hard on you. Um, you know, when I hear you say going from hero to zero, right, in that it tends to be African governments who go from hero to zero, right? When you look at the contributions or the, the, the responsibility of Europe and other colonial masters in the state of Africa today and the state of African leadership today, you know, in your submissions, you said that, and just be patient with me on this question because I was still, you know, formulating it in my mind. In your submissions, you said that, you know, a number of international banks helped the Guptas to cloak the source of their funds, you know, by allowing them to open and maintain bank accounts. And even after the allegations of their involvement in corruption became public, and also when you had, um, you know, revealed this information to the UK government, they were slow to act. And those corporates based in the UK were slow to act, you know. So state capture has also been propped up you know, by international collaboration in the same way that apartheid was propped up 
by international collaborators who deemed the ANC as communists, you know, by white corporations who sold arms to the apartheid government, right, who did business with the apartheid government. You said that you chose sports because you knew that with economic divestment, the apartheid government could always get around that because there were international collaborators willing to do business with the apartheid government. So I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, do you see the parallels between the apartheid state and the Zuma sort of uh, state, or is it not parallels? In my mind, there is a through line and that through line uh, in the sense that there's been a continuation of the violence and the corruption that has been endemic in South Africa because of colonialism and apartheid. I think a lot of people in South Africa try and almost separate the two eras, but for me, they are linked. It is a continuation of some form of colonialism where, you know, international um, Western countries have been, you know, uh, involved in, 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 in the plundering of South Africa today. And I guess the last part of the question is, why is it that Western countries can escape from this kind of plunder without being labeled as going from hero to zero, without the stigma of being corrupt, without being indexed as corrupt countries, but that is the fate that black governments uh, uh, adopt. Well, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to your question, Rohanda. Just by the way, I focused on sport because that's where I thought I could make most of the contribution individually. But actually, I was also supporting the anti-apartheid campaign to get economic disinvestment, to end arms sales, and so on. Uh, you know, we were, it was a multifaceted campaign. Um, one of the things that I very, was very clear about in my contributions in the House of Lords and also in my evidence to the Zondo Commission was it takes two to tango. Yes, the Guptas were criminals uh, and Zuma was part of that criminal enterprise of looting. But there, there were, the, somebody was at the other end of that, paying the, the bribes, paying the, the backhanders, you know, the looting was part, it was the KPMGs and these international corporates, they were, they were part of it as well. And I, I exposed that all. It was known in South Africa, but what it wasn't known in until I was asked to do this, and I'm not indulging in self-praise here, I'm just telling you what happened, is instead of um, being exposed by Amul Bungani and Scorpio in the Daily Maverick and, uh, and other news outlets in South Africa, it was suddenly on the front page of the Financial Times after what I, I, I did, you know, and on, on the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the, uh, and the Washington Post. And then the global corporate bosses of these giant global corporates suddenly got cold feet because their reputations were being damaged in New York and London and not just in Johannesburg when it was a kind of story uh, and an issue confined to the political class in, in, uh, in South Africa and the media in South Africa, they didn't seem too bothered about it. But when their own bottom line started getting hammered, and, and I referred to HSBC, I referred them to the, uh, to the British um, investigative authorities, they then sent their directors to come and meet me and flew in from New York and all that kind of thing. And, but you know, they didn't change. They haven't changed. They haven't helped track down those accounts of those shell companies that the Guptas established, and by that I mean front companies that were established and described in, in, in my book, and, and you know, other investigators have described it as well in South African books and, and media. Um, so yeah, I think your question's a very pertinent one. It's not as if South Africa, apartheid wasn't corrupt. Apartheid was deeply corrupt. There were all sorts of scams uh, and looting going on. Um, I think under Zuma and the Guptas, it was just so shameless. It was so <laughs> brazen. I mean, they just didn't care when it was exposed by, you know, in the Daily Maverick or the Mail of Guardian or wherever it was exposed. They didn't care. I think um, more than being brazen, it's the fact that it's happening under a constitutional democracy. Exactly. You know, exactly. you expect the apartheid government to be corrupt. Yeah. Because the and laws think, themselves were not legitimate. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and Henny van Furen in his in his book, um, I think it's called Apartheid Guns and Money. Yeah. Uh, or Money and Guns. I can't remember the way it around. He just shows how it's a, you know, the there's a continuum as, as you're implying in your question from the apartheid era through. Now that doesn't excuse it. That does not excuse it. And I won't accept, you know, the radical economic transformation brigade who I don't think, I think they're the looters and they only want transformation for themselves, not for the people, which, which I want. And South Africa is not alone in being, having corrupt, but where I think the hero to zero accusation that I use is, and I might have been the author of that phrase, is because such lofty ambitions were established in 1994. I mean, the world was um, was captivated by the rainbow nation at that stage. That's why I think um, uh, you know the, the the fall has been so so fast and so deep. But of course, corruption is not confined to Africa. Of course, it isn't, and it owes. At least have uh, the worst consequences for it, and we almost Indeed. become the face Indeed. of it. Indeed. When historically colonialism was the worst form of corruption, and in certain ways it continues today. And when you talk about loftiness, similarly with the US, you know, uh, they, they lofty democratic ideals, but they've been, you know, involved in capturing foreign states and manipulating foreign states and regime changes and all of that, but they're able to survive these things without that indexing as corrupt but you know um yeah i, I agree there's yeah. a lot of there's a there's total hypocrisy in this i mean there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of corruption right across the world in moscow in beijing in you know in in european capitals and and so on and i've mentioned the recent covid uh, cases in mm -hmm. in britain and uh, i and I, think I, I come i come back to because that generation of struggle leaders set high standards. I mean, none of them were saints. None of us are saints. Mm. None of us ever pretend to be, but uh, me included. But, um, you know, they, they set high, such high standards. And that's why the international anti-apartheid movement was such a powerful force, mm. why so many hundreds of thousands of activists mobilized, inspired by Mandela and Tambo and Sisulu and, and, and Slovo and uh, Kastrils and, and many other names others that I could name. Mm. And I guess since, since your, um, your submissions, you know, you spoke about cross-border cooperation and engagement of the public and private sectors, you know, to, um, that unless that happens, unless there is cross-border cooperation and fighting this kind of corruption, that no country will be free from this kind of financial crime. Do you see that developing? Do, are you seeing that uh, collaboration, that international coordination, global no. Co coordination? No. Why not? I mean, there's there's two trillion dollars, the figure I use in my book, and I used before the Zondo Commission, two trillion trillion dollars, American dollars, U.S. dollars, uh, money laundered every year, and mostly. And all of it goes through the international financial institutions, the banks, some of them high street banks and town center banks, a lot of them. And I don't see any sign that London or Washington or Moscow or Beijing, let alone Johannesburg or, um, or Dubai, Dubai is a very important center for this, uh, this, this uh, looting because a lot of the Gupta money went through them. Uh, and through Hong Kong. Uh, the Dubai authorities have never done anything about it. The Dubai authorities are, you know, clients of the um, of London and, and Washington and allies and so on. Um, Beijing's done nothing about Hong Kong. Moscow mm. is deeply corrupt. So, you know, I think we have a global system of, of international finance that is deeply corrupt. And when I said to the leaders of the banks, HSBC and Standard Chartered, um, when they came to me to complain that I was being too, too un unfair, amongst other things, um, I said, well, why don't you now work with the South African 
enforcement authorities, the British enforcement authorities, and anybody else who's willing to do anything about it, and open up your books. So we know where the, the Gupta billions went, because it went through from Johannesburg almost exclusively, not in brown paper packets out of, you know, on, in the holes of, of flights from ORT, but actually through the international financial pipelines of the world. And they're all digitally transmitted and they can be digitally tracked. They leave a footprint. Will these banks cooperate? No, they say client confidentiality. Forgive me of using this term in such a, an important prestigious event, but I mean, that's bullshit. <laughs> Uh, you and I and all the others uh, involved in this event, and I see there are, you know, uh, over 130. Uh, we can ex we should we should be entitled to client confidentiality in our personal bank accounts. Most of them, I should think, pretty modest. But international criminals should not be entitled to client confidentiality. The international financial institution should be collaborating with the enforcement authorities and opening up you know, the books, so we can try and get the money back. And by the way, it's not just the banks, it's the lawyers, the international legal firms who set up these shell companies, who gave the guidance. It's the KPMGs and the McKinsey's and the Bain and Co and, and the rest of them who enabled all of this to happen and got fat fees from us. Mm. Yeah, and, and again, being mindful of time, I'd like, to speed along to an interesting article that you wrote on vaccine apartheid. And you know, you detail how Western countries like the US and the UK are now offering third shots to their citizens when other countries have been unable to uh, vaccinate a significant uh, amount of the um, number of these citizens. And uh, Britain has vaccinated, I think 67% at the time that you wrote the, the article but uh, on the African continent, it was around 3%. And um, you say that the problem lies in a global economy that has allowed a handful of transnational corporations to patent and monopolize you know, the vaccine. And I think part of, for me, the term of vaccine apartheid is not limited to the distribution of um, vaccines. It's also the history of big pharma, of these uh, corporations to experiment on African people. I mean, even last year, there were talks of the vaccine being trialed in Africa first, which you know, created a lot of suspicion around that. So um, you know, I, I just wanted to, to get a sense from you of how do we dismantle this? Why is sort of um, the, the, the healthcare apartheid by big pharma, we saw it with the AIDS crisis, we're seeing it again. Why has it continued and why has it not been met with the same eye as state sanctioned apartheid, right? Why do we almost accept it as the world order that we, us on the continent will always be the last to gain such life uh, saving um, medicine? Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with the, with the imperative behind your question, Rwando, uh, I mean, um, and I'll come back to the sort of global question because it also takes us back to ORT and, and the strategy for transformation and whether it was the right course to adopt or, or not. Um, the thing that I think is most important about understanding about the vaccine situation is that what happened was the G7 countries, they held a summit in Cornwall with Boris Johnson in the chair, and they pledged some minuscule amount, relatively speaking. What they should have been done is they should have actually established and invested in production facilities in African countries, which is what Cyril Ramaphosa and other African countries leaders asked for. So they should have done that in collaboration with local governments. So it wasn't just a question of flying in vaccines from produced in, uh, in, in Europe uh, or America or Beijing or, or Moscow it was a, or Russia. It was actually a question of, of, of establishing companies, production facilities, manufacturing facilities controlled by um, the people in those countries. And then that you know, comes back to the global 
neoliberal economics system of capitalism that we've got. And it also comes back to how difficult it is to, and I experienced it at first, this at first hand in, in a Labour government, uh, how difficult it is in this global order to actually make change. You just got to keep pressing for change. It isn't easy because the forces are, are arranged against you, but you've got to keep trying. And so my answer on vaccine apartheid is, it's not just a question of inequality that goes way back, as you say, to colonial times. It is like corruption does. It is also a question of actually decentralizing the production and the facilities um, so that Africans can manufacture their own vaccines. Mm. You know, Peter, I, I could uh, keep this conversation going for another hour, but I've just been given the indication that we have less than five minutes. So I'm going to leave you with two questions and maybe you'll answer both or you'll choose the one that speaks to you the most. One is, I really love the fact that your book is called Pretoria Boy. I love that when I listen to you speak in your interviews, when you say South Africa, you say we, you still include yourself. And you, you, you still consider yourself South African. You know, what does that mean to you being South African? Is it just a technicality, a biographical fact of your birth? Or is it a state of mind and a choice? That's my one question. My other question is on O.R. Tambo. What do you think his legacy calls us to do in this moment of our civic life, in this moment of, you know, um, our national life and of our constitutional democracy? You know, what do you, what are you feel, what do you feel you're called to do by his legacy? Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, just briefly on, on my own kind of identity. I mean, South Africa is in my DNA. My childhood was there. My parents uh, were South African born. Uh, so it's part of me and always will be. And the fact that I'm no longer involved in frontline British politics has meant that I've had a bit more time to visit the country and enjoy its uh, amazing opportunities uh, and um, got lots of friends uh, in, in the country. And I feel maybe I've been able the last few years to, to, to make a small contribution towards um, improving things. And that's always been trying to make a difference has been my kind of watchword. So that's me. I have actually probably now, <laughs> I've lived most of my life in, in Wales, more, more time in three decades in Wales the first 16 years of my life in, in, in South Africa, except, except um, of course, uh, well, I was briefly born in Kenya. Um, and then quarter of a century, the 30 years, the bulk, the bulk of my life so far has been spent in Wales. So I suppose I'm a bit more Welsh than South African, <laughs> but probably my accent doesn't betray that. Now on, 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 the, on the bigger question that, that you asked, which was, um, really about the spirit of OR today. You know, I think that um, OR, my reading of him uh, is that he was a constitutional Democrat in essence. He was an egalitarian and in his own way a socialist as well, but he was above all a constitutional Democrat. And for him as a lawyer, the rule of law and a constitution that protected every citizen rich or poor, black or white, whatever their religion, every citizen's human rights was fundamental to his politics. And that must never be forgotten. Um, and so I mean, I mentioned um, the imprisonment of, of former President Zuma by the Constitutional Court. I mean, that was an important moment. Uh, people complain that not enough has been done and their right to complain to bring the looters to, to justice. But that was an important moment. And I think his spirit still lives in the operation of the Constitution Court. And his spirit should, and his values, should inform much more fundamentally the way that ANCs operate, operate because if it, if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't follow the OR, the OR route, it's going to die and will deserve to do so. Um, so I think whether you, Whatever, whatever you look about his, his contribution, those values, that leadership should be, the leaders of South Africa today, locally, provincially, or nationally, should be listening to what OR 
Oa's values were, and they should be acting by them and living their lives by them. Mm. And we should all try to do that, however imperfect we all are. And I think that is the high point where I'd like to leave our conversation. And thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You've spent two hours with us and I wish you nothing but the best. And I hope everyone who's tuned in to our conversation will go get Pretoria Boy. And I hope to meet you in person one day. So I'll That would be there. lovely. That would be <laughs> lovely. The wonder. Thank you so much. Over thank to you, you Natasha. And thank you, everybody. The anti-apartheid movement, in a way, brought everybody together, and that was its genius, and that was particularly Oliver Tambo's vision, that he was a very broad leader. He brought everybody together, uh, different political parties. He was a non-sectarian but militant head of the ANC in exile. Remember, this was a man who supported the underground struggle, was part of MK's high command, but at the same time strode the diplomatic corridors of the world, talked to church leaders, mobilized the trade unions, appealed to young activists like myself, young militants. He had this extraordinary ability, did Oliver Tambo, to uh, appeal to such a wide spectrum of opinion and uh, levels of activism from the militants and the revolutionaries to the respected, uh, rather middle-of-the-road opponents of apartheid, which was reviled for the evil that it was. You know, one cannot deliver a speech, or really anything, do anything in South Africa right now, without mentioning the risk of imminent load shedding, which is a sad reality for me in a few minutes. So with that in mind, I just want to allow you to quickly thank all of you for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and the discussion as much as I did. Um, I'd like to thank Kamsila, Naidu and Dali Tambo for allowing us to use the clips that we, you've seen tonight from O.R. Tambo, The Jewel in Our Crown, which is an incredible film. Um, it, you should definitely watch it. I'd like to thank uh, my board of trustees at the Tumble Foundation for their guidance in putting together this event. And of course, my team, uh, without which today would not have been possible. And also obviously like to thank my partners and sponsors of this event, SAFM and Brand South Africa, um, for making this happen and for allowing us to reach as large an audience as we have been able to, because that is what we need to do with the Tumble legacy and the Tumble values. And finally, of course, I'd like to thank Luando Caso and Lord Hain, who one day I will definitely call Peter and not try and, you know, get shocked in doing so. Thank you so much for such a thought provoking discussion. The questions and comments that we've been seeing all over social media here in the Zoom room are incredible. I wish there was so much more time to discuss all of this, uh, but please do like and follow at Tumble Foundation across all social media platforms to stay abreast of all the events and programs we're doing. Also get in touch with us at info at Tumble Foundation. Dot org dot za. And I think finally, from me, I'd just like to say, as Lord uh, Hayne mentioned in a speech, quoting Andre Odendal's forthcoming book, and I see Andre is one of the attendees in the event tonight, his book, Dear Comrade President, How Oliver Tambo Laid the Foundation for South Africa's Constitution. In it, he says, the oppressed rested justice from history and managed to define the contours of their own destiny. Freedom was not given to them. They engineered and won it. And I think as we all, you know, exercise our rights and responsibility in this constitutional democracy, it's really important to remember that to shape the world we actually want and the world that, and country that Oliver Tumble would have been proud of. So with that, I bid you a good night. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. We invite you to a place in Africa that is like no other, where new ways of doing business happen every day, where the world watches our talent in fascination.
South Africa's rich in gold, diamonds, and manufacturing expertise. We embrace global innovation and technology trends. A winning country where all dreams are valid and realized. Where we always come together and build a better future and country. Come invest with us. Believe in South Africa. South Africa, inspiring new ways.